And I'm going to go ahead and get started. I don't want to waste your time. Um, I appreciate you taking time to be here with me tonight. And we're going to go ahead and jump right in and start talking about these tips that are going to save you time and headaches. So my goals for this live training tonight, I want to make sure that you can learn that there are things you can do when you are a landlord to help get the best tenants possible in your rentals. Um, I, we're going to be talking about, and I want to make sure you understand why stacking your showings will save you time. Um, I'm going to talk about the importance of a good listing. I'm going to also, you know, share with you and hope that you learn one thing you must do when it comes to tenant screening. So tenant screening is a loaded topic in and of itself. Um, I'll, I'll be doing a training on that, you know, in the future, I'm sure, all on its own because it's such a loaded topic. But there was one tip that I want to share with you tonight that is, um, I think, super important. And then I also have a bonus tip for you as well, something Kirk and I actually just came up with last night, actually, after showing a property. So that's kind of where we're going this evening here in this training. Um, okay, so I want to start by saying, you know, self-managing doesn't have to be a scary thing. I know a lot of people uh, get into real estate investing or are hesitant or allow, um, you know, this idea of, of being a landlord to kind of scare them off. And, you know, this doesn't have to be you. You don't have to be the landlord that gets the call at 2 a.m. Because the funny thing is, when it comes to kind of being a landlord, this, those are the stories that we always hear. We always hear the landlords who are talking about how, oh, they have these terrible tenants and, oh, you know, the tenants called at 2 a.m. because there was a sock in the toilet or the toilet was clogged, right? Or they needed a light bulb change. It was something that was stupid and a waste of time and frustrating. And, you know, unfortunately, those are the stories that we always hear when it comes to being a landlord. And so I want you to know that this doesn't have to be you. The truth is, these are the horror stories you tend to hear. I mean, the reality is, unfortunately, people don't often talk about how amazing their tenants are or how they pay on time every month, right? Those aren't the stories that we typically hear unless something prompts somebody to say that. In most cases, we hear those horror stories, we hear those negative stories, and those stories a lot of times are enough to keep people holding like to, enough to hold people back and to keep people from going down this road of investing in rental property and buying those first couple of properties and self-managing them because they're scared about being a landlord. And, and that's just the truth. But the reality is that, you know, you don't, every tenant isn't going to be a terrible tenant in a horror, you know, and have a horror story. And the reality is, I think if we've learned anything, Kirk and I, over the last four or five years of investing, it's that you have a lot of control over trying to avoid those horror stories. Now, can we always avoid them? No. Are you going to get a few bad apples? Yes. Have we had a few bad apples? Yes. But the reality is it doesn't have to be the majority of your tenants. Um, <laughs> you know, I threw this picture in because I feel like this is kind of what, what a lot of us think about or maybe the stories that we hear is this idea of just, you know, walking around and it's all these bad stories. And the reality is, you know, if you do it right, in most cases, you can get great tenants in your properties who are going to be good, who are good people, who are hardworking people, who are going to respect your property, and everything's going to be fine. And again, like I said, can you stop everything bad from happening? No. You're going to, if you are in this long enough, you're going to have something crazy happen. Um, you're going to get a bad apple. It's just the reality of it. And if you know that up front, I think that's okay. Um, but the reality is every single tenant doesn't have to be a bad apple. So what I want to talk about are some tips tonight and some necessary things you can do to attract good tenants and then therefore choose the best one from your tenant pool. There's, in fact, things that are in your control um, that, you know, are going to allow you to attract those good tenants. So and those, these tips that I'm going to share with you tonight are going to save you time hopefully also going to save you money because, you know, a lot of times when we get bad tenants in there, then that's costly, whether they destroy it or whether you have to evict them, or you have to do cash for keys, those sorts of things. So the tips I want to share with you tonight, hopefully will save you time and money and headaches as well. So tip number one, I'm going to share with you tonight, it has to do with scheduling showings. And I want to share a story with you. Um, Kirk and I bought our first rental property in 2012. So we've been at this for, you know, a little while now. 
And we, if you don't know our story, I'll briefly kind of tell you the, the first story of buying our first rental property. Um, we were, you know, just married a couple of years, both working full-time jobs. Kirk convinced me into this whole rental property thing. So we couldn't afford to buy a property in the town that we lived. Prices were too expensive. Taxes were too expensive. We just didn't have a lot of money at the time. And so we basically started then looking in the outskirts of the area and town that we lived in. And we found, um, you know, a couple of towns about 40 to 45 minutes west of where we lived. And that's where we ultimately ended up buying. So our first rental property that we ever bought, actually the first two rental properties that we ever bought, were 45 minutes away from where we lived, right? So, you know, maybe not such a big deal. But when you're working full time, I was also in grad school at the time, um, you know, it was it was a, a bit of a chore to get out there, but we bought it. It was a, it was a um, HUD owned property. And so it had been foreclosed and it needed some renovations, right? There were some holes in the walls. We put new flooring and paint and all sorts of stuff. And Kirk and I did that pretty much all on our own. I think we paid, I think the only thing we had somebody come in and do was putting the ceramic tile down because we tried and had a little bit of an utter failure. So we brought somebody in to do that. We did everything else. And so we put a lot of blood, sweat, and tears and a lot of sweat equity into that first rental property. And when it came time to show the property, it was about a two-month process that it took us working weekends and nights. Um, we had a ton of calls on the property. It was a good property in a good location. We had fixed it up, so it was nice. Um, and so when we got the calls, we you know went about just the way we assumed we were supposed to do it. And we set up individual times to show the properties. We had, you know, a handful of people interested and we set up, you know, on, on various different days throughout the week. Oh, okay. This person could come Tuesday night and this person could come Thursday. This person could come Saturday. So we set those individual times up to show the property. We got ready. We drove 45 minutes to the property to show it for the very first time. We were super excited. I remember being nervous and anxious and not really sure what to expect. And this is what happened. We ultimately uh, got stood up, believe it or not. Um, so this was us. We sat in our, you know, newly renovated condo and we stared at each other, rental application in hand, ready to go. And the guy didn't show up. Uh, and I couldn't believe it. I was flabbergasted. I was flabbergasted at the fact that responsible adult, uh, a responsible adult didn't show up, right? This just blew me in mind. Like, sure, I might expect a teenager, or maybe if this was like somebody who was a, you know, right out of college, or maybe in college, like, maybe I would expect that of them just because they're a little bit younger, and, and maybe don't necessarily have that full, mature, responsible attitude. But I never expected a grown adult, responsible, working adult to just totally stand us up. And I will tell you that this was our very first lesson about self-managing rental property that we learned. On our, on our very first property, on our very first showing, we learned this important lesson. And I can tell you what's crazy is that it didn't just happen that one time. It happened a few more times until we actually decided to come up with some sort of game plan, right? And we got sick of people wasting our time. Kirk, my husband, got so agitated about it. I was probably a little bit more uh, flexible with it than he was. Um, but it was extremely frustrating, especially because with this property, our first one, we had to drive 45 minutes to get there. So it was a total waste of time on our part. And so we, you know, kind of realized and decided like, okay, this isn't working. People are wasting our time. Apparently people cannot be, you know, accounted for, or we can't, you know, think that they're going to be responsible. So we have to come up with a solution that's going to work for us so that we don't get stood up again. So my tip for you tonight after this story is to stack your show showings or do an open house type showing. So after we kind of learned in the trenches and had this learning moment, um, we've never made individual appointments again. If only one person can show up at a particular time that suits our schedule, we won't, we won't set that appointment up because for us, we've just been stood up a handful of times and it's just not worth our time. So anytime that we are going to show a property, we do kind of an open house type showing or we do stacking. So when I say stacking, what I mean is that we either schedule them maybe five or 10 minutes apart. So we might say, okay, you know, let's, I'll meet you at five. I'll meet you at 510. I'll meet you at 520 and I'll meet you at 530. Right. 
or we do an open house style showing where we just tell everyone to come. And that's actually what we did last night. One of our properties is vacant right now. We have, it's about 25 to 30 minutes away from the town that we live in. And it's in a neighboring town. And so, you know, we had to pack the kids in the car last night. We drove out there, um, but we did an open house type showing. And I had about seven different parties, if you want to put it that way, families and couples and single people and whatever. But there were about seven different parties that came through this open house. And we just said, I set it up. I said, we'll be there at five. And the people came. And there's some good things about doing an open house. Yes, you don't necessarily get that kind of one-on-one -on -one time with the tenant, maybe to really feel them out. But at the same time, um, you know, human nature, when people see that there are other people interested in it, it gets a little bit more competitive. People realize, oh man, you know, like this might be something I really need to move on quickly. So it starts to get some of the, those juices flowing. And so, you know, not only is it saving you time and you're not being stood up, um, but it also can maybe help to motivate potential tenants to make decisions and move a little bit faster than maybe they would otherwise. So tip number one is stack your showings or do some sort of open house where, you know, if you have five people scheduled to come and somebody doesn't come up, you still have four people there and it wasn't a total waste of your time. So definitely tip number one, we learn that quickly in our own process. All right, tip number two has to do with tenant screening. And what I'm basically saying to you is make the dang phone call, right? Make the phone calls. So there are a number of things that go into tenant screening that you should be doing on a regular basis. And like I said, at kind of the opening of this training tonight, um, there's a lot of stuff that's a loaded topic and, you know, a topic for another night. But I want to focus on this one thing, and that is <laughs> making the phone call. And I say that because, I, because we have, again, another quick story. Um, we are renting out one of our condos. In fact, it was the very first condo that we had um, purchased. This was a couple of years later. And we had a tenant who was super interested. Kirk went and showed the property. The guy was super interested in it. Like he wanted to like sign the lease right there, go get cash for deposit, like all right there. So, you know, Kirk came home and he was telling me about it. And while that might seem amazing to some, and for a split second, I think we both were really excited that he was so interested and ready to move so quickly. Like, oh man, we, we had that listed and could have it rented in a matter of a couple of days. But we decided to stick to our tenant screening process and follow our system. So we had him fill out the application, we called, pulled credit and did the background check, and then we made the phone calls. And that's where the focus is on this. And when we made the phone call, we actually learned a lot about this potential tenant who was overly eagerly excited to get into this property. His employer actually told us when we called to verify his employment that he was about to let him go from his job, like that week that we had talked to this, this man. You know, and he said, you know, please don't tell him this, like, but I understand if he's going to rent your place, like he's going to be unemployed and so he's not gonna be having an income. And so, you know, I realize that I wanna be open and frank with you so that you know, you know, kind of what's happening. So my tip number two is always make those phone calls because had we let ourselves get too excited about his excitement in wanting the place and totally skipped our process, then we could have ended up with a tenant who was unemployed and potentially wouldn't be able to pay rent. And then that could have just spiraled into you know, a whole number of different issues. So while rental applications, we often ask for, you know, there are things that you should be asking for, like your employer information, supervisor information, phone numbers, previous like landlords or previous property managers that you could call, even character references, make those phone calls. Even though sometimes it feels like a, a pain or you don't want to, or there's a million other things you should be doing, make that call because that definitely saved us and we were able to, you know, go with another tenant and everything worked out and, and everything was fine. But had we not made that call and just kind of impulsively went with this excited person, that could have turned into a major disaster. All right, my tip number three for you tonight is how <laughs> to talk about listings and how important listings are when you're putting them up. When it comes to writing a listing, you want to make sure to put some time into it. You don't just want to throw something together and throw it up on Craigslist. Um, you have to realize that this is your potential tenant's first impression of you and your property. So you want to make it good. And if you've ever put yourself, if you have 
gone through and done kind of a rental audit that I talk about um, a lot in our community where you're really analyzing kind of the market and you're looking at other listings that are out there and you put yourself in the shoes of a tenant and you look at the listings, um, it's interesting to look at it from kind of a tenant's perspective because you easily can get turned off very quickly by the way in which or the manner in which a listing is put together. So the other thing to realize is that people today are impulsive and they want information now. They don't want to wait, you know, they, it's for them to be able to text you or call you because, you know, some, they want to know if you allow pets or if there's parking, um, you know, that's friction in the process. And you want to minimize that friction in the process of getting somebody to look at your property online or wherever you have it listed and somebody to, to contact you to, to view it, right? Or to schedule a showing, however you go about doing that. So you wanna have a good descriptive listing with good details and great pictures. So I just kind of scrolled around through Craigslist today and I grabbed these and I wanted to show you kind of what I mean by this. So if you can look at this listing, there was great pictures and you can see it kind of in the small, they have pictures of bathrooms and bedrooms, kitchen, you can see in the headline, large one bedroom apartment with central hair and heat, gives you an idea of space, gives you um, like demographics of the apartment, central air and heat, where it's located. And then you can see they have a lot of information. They give you the description that talks a lot about all of the, you know, the bedrooms, the ceiling fans, HVAC, all of that sort of stuff, all of the amenities that are available for you, general details, rental terms, pet policy, um, so there's a lot of really good information on this listing that somebody could easily see that, get most of the information that they need and be able to, you know, decide right then and there whether or not they'd be interested in staying there. And again, it all comes down to saving you time, right? That was kind of my purpose for tonight was to talk about things that are going to save you time. You don't want people calling you, asking you 50 million questions or coming and, you know, scheduling a showing and looking at the property when they maybe, you know, they have a dog and you don't find out they have a dog until you're actually at that showing. And there you go. If you don't allow pets, well, then you've just totally wasted your time. You wasted their time. You know, everybody's time was wasted simply because either it wasn't listed in your listing that no pets were allowed or they forgot to ask before they set up the appointment, right? So the reality is the more information that you can put on a listing, the better. And honestly, you know, the better the listing is and put together, you're only going to attract good tenants. So I want to want you to compare it to this one. And this was another one that I found. And it was, you can see that the headline's a lot different. One bedroom doesn't tell you anything about where it is. The best thing about this headline is that it says luxury apartment. Um, however, when I read that, I'm like, well, if it's a luxury apartment, then they should be having some great pictures on here to prove that it's a luxury apartment, but there are no pictures, right? So to me, that's as from a tenant's perspective, I'm automatically going, okay, red flag, if it's really a luxury apartment, like wouldn't you be putting pictures up for that? And you can see that the listing is, there's some information It talks about where it's located, second floor, remote control fireplace, dining room, equipped kitchen, um, air conditioning, French doors. So it does give you some of that information, but the reality is, I mean, if you were comparing these listings back and forth, and trying to decide, hmm, which one do I want to call on, right? You're probably going to call on this one if it's, you know, in the same location, just because of all the information, the pictures, and all of that, you're going to be more, more inclined to go after this one than you would be this one, right? So again, it comes down to taking your time and putting in, you know, making sure that you're putting out there a good listing that people can really get a lot of information from and people can get excited about your property, right? That's what you want them to do. You want them to get excited about it. So tip number three is you need to write good listings. You need to take great pictures of spaces that people actually want to see. I talk a lot about this in our, um, our self-managing for success course that we have in our pro community. I have a whole video on writing listings and, and walk you through how to write a listing, give you a checklist of all the things you should be including on a listing. But pictures are super important. You want to make sure you're putting pictures up of the spaces people want to see, you know, and tenants want to see kitchens. They want to see bedrooms. They want to see bathrooms. A lot of tenants want to see and hear about storage space. 
right? Because if they, you know, are a tenant and a renter, they don't have, you know, a basement at a house where they can keep stuff. You know, they might want to find out, do I need to get a storage unit or is there any kind of storage there, right? I was, when I was showing the property last night, that was a big question that they had. Um, so you want to make sure that you're taking good pictures with good lighting of the spaces that people want to see. And like I said, give a lot of detail on your picture, on your listings, so people can have their questions answered. That's ultimately going to save you time and hopefully not waste your time to show properties to people who, you know, ultimately can't stay there or for whatever reason, you know, have pets and it's non-pet friendly place. So write good listings. All right, so I have a bonus tip for you. I know I said it was three tips, but I, I wanted to share this one because actually Kirk and I just came up with it last night um, in the car. It's not something we have done before. So while all the other things are things that we have done out in the field in our own investing journey, this is a new one we actually thought about in the car on the way home from showing this property last night. I mentioned that um, last night we went and we showed, we had an open house type showing. We had about seven different parties through and on the way home, we were talking about it and um, we actually decided like when you, why we, we were talking about on the way home, we're like, why don't we have something that we give them whenever we're showing the properties, especially in an, in an open house or stack showing type setting where you don't have a lot of one-on-one -on -one time with the people. Um, you, how great would it be to be able to have something that you give them an information sheet for them that they can take with them when they leave. So for instance, when you've gone and looked at a property to buy, anyone here that's looked and, and bought a property before, you often get a listing sheet from the agent and it has all the necessary info for that property. So our thought last night was, well, why don't we make one of those to give when we show our renters? Like, it seems so simple and probably maybe even some of you that are on this call tonight, um, you know, might look at this and be like, well, yeah, duh. And that was kind of like what we said to each other. We looked at each other last night and we were like, well, duh, why are we not doing this? This is something that's so simple. Um, and you can include information on there, like the beds and baths, square footage, the rental amount, lease terms, how much the security deposit is. If there are any amenities, what those are, room descriptions, you can include some pictures on there, school district, uh, local parks, entertainment, grocery, hospital, contact info for you if they want to get back in touch with you as the landlord, a link to your online rental application if you have an online rental application, right? So it's funny because all this stuff sounds like so silly in the sense of I can't believe we haven't done this before, but we haven't. And so it's something that we are going to start implementing um, when we show our properties, we're going to start doing this and see, you know, just how in terms of, you know, getting people to call back, um, and just kind of see how that process goes. I think it's nice to be able to hand people something when they leave. You know, we always follow up via text message or via um, email with a link to our online rental application. Um, but I just think it's also nice for them to take something tangible with them and that's in their car that they put on their fridge and it reminds them, um, you know, of the place. It reminds them of or helps them think about their questions to ask. So this is a kind of a bonus tip that we're sharing with you. We haven't tested it yet. It's something we're going to test. Um, if you like it, if you've used it before, if you've heard of somebody using it before, let me know in the comments section um, so that, you know, we can, I have an idea of, you know, if other people are doing this too, but definitely something that we are thinking about um, implementing now and kind of a bonus tip for you to think about. So like I said, we're going to start implementing this um, and I'll kind of keep you guys updated on how it goes and what the, what the response is like to this. So you know, one of the things that I hope that you realize in this training tonight, of, for some of you who might be new to any of these trainings or new to Rental Rookie generally, you know, Kirk and I are all, all about and our mission at Rental Rookie is to teach you, you know, what we're learning out in the trenches. So we have learned over the course of the last five years, you know, through trial and error. We didn't know a lot when we got started, um, and it's just been an incomplete, utter learning process through the whole way. So when plan A doesn't work plan b doesn't work we have to come up with a plan c and that's just what we do and you know one of the big reasons we started rental rookie and i started rental rookie was because i wanted to kind of share and show people out there that you know you don't have to have a real estate or finance or any kind of background like that to be able to be successful in this you know i went from being an english teacher who knew nothing about real estate or finance didn't even know what the heck an roi meant 
And here we are four or five years later, I've left my job. I handle our real estate portfolio now full time while, while running rental rookie. So like anybody can do it. And it's, you know, our mission is to just share with you what we're learning, what works, what doesn't work. Um, we're just continuing to do this week in and week out. So I hope that you'll leave here tonight and you'll have some new tips and tricks that will help you in your own self-managing. If you're interested in learning more about self-managing, um, we do have a self-managing for success course in our um, Rental Rookie Pro community. In there, we have videos on learning how to write effective listings. You can see what you need in a rental application to ensure you are asking for the necessary information. We have a whole video on tenant screening so that you can get the best possible tenants in there. And we also have a video where I walk you through a lease and go over some of the things that you should have in a good lease. So if you're interested in that, you can go to rentalrookie.com slash pro. If you want to actually kind of get a preview of what the course looks like, um, you can click on the link in the um, like description to this live video. Um, on there, I put a link to kind of a preview page so that you can check that out. So if you're interested, definitely check that out. Um, and again, if there are questions, throw them in the comment section. If you're not watching this live with us and watching it later, leave me a comment, ask me a question, and I will get back to you. Um, otherwise, thanks again for tuning in tonight on this live training, and we will see you next week for next week's live training. And until then, happy investing.